Good evening. Good evening. Hi. My name is Jeffrey. Um, hi, and uh, thanks for coming uh, to the talk. Um, right, and today, uh, you know, this is actually the first uh, uh, talk, right, in, in the new year. And, uh, you know, I was uh, thinking of, uh, you, know, um, you know, what sort of talks we can have. And I was thinking, uh, I thought that it was a good idea to, uh, you know, to, to organize the talks um, uh, to coincide um, with certain events. Okay, so for today's talk, we have uh, this universal, okay, we're going to talk about this universal concept called love, right? More specifically, right, love in art. Okay, and uh, I'm also proposing some, a uh, couple of other talks like, you know, one to coincide with, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Good Friday, right, about the theme of death in art. Okay, and, you know, so, so look out for the next uh, few talks, right? Okay, um, yes, I mean, we're all very familiar with, uh, you know, this uh, so-called concept called love. Um, and I suppose, you know, love is actually, uh, if, you, if you are familiar with art history, right, it's actually a major, a recurring theme in art history, right? Many, uh, you know, uh, 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 famous artists have dealt with this theme. Um, and really, I mean, Artists themselves, for example, you know, they have uh, led very colourful love lives themselves. Okay, um, you know, uh, many of those great artists, they have their muses, right? Muses are people who actually, you know, women who inspire them. Okay, and uh, in fact, uh, quite a number of them also had relationships with their own models, for example. Okay, so love is, uh, you know, so there's no one better, right, to, I, I feel, to represent this uh, concept called love than artists themselves. Okay, right, because, uh, you know, they, they are highly sensitive, right, um, um, to, to this uh, uh, concept. Okay, so what you see here, um, so the, the kind of love, of course, love is a very broad theme, right? So I'm going to just uh, specifically focus on so-called romantic love, right, rather than, um, as of, you know, rather than, for example, love between parents and children or love between, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of religious love, right, between God and, you know, man. Okay, so I'm going to focus on that. And uh, the slide you see there, right, is um, uh, a work by Roy Lichtenstein. Okay, and uh, Lichtenstein was a pop artist, okay, uh, together with uh, people like Andy Warhol. Okay, and as a pop artist, you know, he appropriate um, his language from, okay, not only his language, but his motifs. Okay, from pop art, from popular culture, right? So, uh, you know, they, appro they were appropriate uh, from advertisements, uh, you know, um, uh, um, mass consumer products, okay? And in the case of uh, Lichtenstein, it's um, actually comic strips. So comic strips actually for, uh, were sources for his art. Okay, so he would appropriate um, now, we are not sure as to how he select the comic strips, okay, but he, you know, he would, um, uh, normally many of his comic strips uh, were taken from those uh, melodramatic kind of uh, uh, comics, right, and then he would just take a single frame, he would blow it up, as you can see here, okay, and he would uh, transform it into his own distinctive aesthetic, okay, the use of uh, very simplified uh, you know, primary colors, the bold, black outlines, okay, and then he will also replicate the kind of the process we see in, uh, uh, you know, uh, mass printing, like the band-aid dots, okay, the band-aid dots are not visible on, on the slides, but, you know, he did apply the band-aid dots, where, which, which were actually applied in uh, printing, right, to give the kind of half-tone, right, to, um, you know, to the image. Okay, so this is uh, a work. I mean, it so happens that, you know, <laughs> the, the, my name is there as well, right? Okay, so even the balloons on these uh, comic strips, uh, I believe are also modified, right? Uh, not, I think, to a significant extent, but they, they are modified, okay? So he, he has transformed the picture somewhat from right, the original, right, into his uh, very own distinctive style, okay? Um, so uh, in terms of composition, in terms of uh, his uh, impact, Right, I would say that uh, Legion Science work, um, you know, are very appealing in that sense, okay, and uh, accessible. Although he has been accused of 
uh, being uh, banal, or even accused of just simply copying right, uh, from you know, uh, popular culture. And of course, I think you know, when you talk about love, I mean, we cannot uh, ignore this, you know, this, this work by Robert Indiana. I'm sure you have, all of you have seen this work in one form or another, okay? Whether in postcards or, I don't know, on, on you know, marks, right? Okay, um, but actually the idea for this uh, came, you know, I mean, Robert Indiana um, was a pop artist also, an artist in the pop art uh, kind of movement style. And, uh, you know, he was doing a lot of numbers and signs, okay, for his work. Okay, and, uh, and one day he was just uh, uh, um, playing with uh, uh, poetry, okay, when, uh, you know, he sort of uh, rearranged this, the, the, the letters, okay, and, you know, according to the story, that's how, you know, he, he came to, um, you know, develop this work, all right, okay, and uh, in fact, the work first appeared as a Christmas card commissioned by the uh, Museum of Modern Art. I believe it's 19, the date was 19, uh, the year was 1965. And, um, and of course, and, and in that era, uh, you know, this work became, you know, there was no social media then, but you know, it, it became very popular because uh, it was the, a period of the counterculture, right? You know, of, uh, of free love, and uh, peace. Okay, so this uh, this became an icon of 1960s idealism. Okay, so you know that's how I think you know the, the this this particular uh, image actually spread, right? Okay, and uh, it, I mean it became so successful later on. Uh, it, it it became uh, it was transformed into a postage stamp. Okay, where millions were actually sold. And uh, in the, I think in the early 70s, it was, this work was translated into um, sculpture, three-dimensional form, okay? And sculptural um, examples of this work have, are now, you know, uh, can be found in major cities around the world, right? In Taipei, in, uh, in South Korea, in Japan, in Singapore, okay? And in Singapore, for those uh, old enough to know, right, in the early 1990s, right, this, uh, the sculpture itself used to be, uh, anyone can, uh, yes, yes, TGIF, there was a restaurant called TGIF, I used to eat there, you know, right, yeah, that's at Park Mall, and it used to stand outside there, and it has become quite iconic in the local context, but do you know where it is now? Okay, okay, it's now off the main road, you can't see it, you know, when it was at Park Mall, okay, you could still see it, right, uh, you know, along the main road, now it's at uh, Winsland House, Okay, it's, it's, it's still close, close to Park Mall, it's, at, it's in uh, Penang Road, okay? Right? Um, unfortunately, it's not, you know, it's off the main, the main road, right? And, uh, you know, and, and I think this work became popular also for its aesthetic, I, I believe, you know? I mean, the way he arranges the letters, especially the, the slanted O, for example, you know, um, the colours especially are, are quite uh, accessible and appealing. Okay, um, but in terms of uh, where did he get, get this idea, you know, for love, you know, um, this work is at once both personal and uh, religious and autobiographical, okay, and it was said that he got this idea when he was uh, in a Christian science church and he saw a sign saying, God is love, right, and the colours uh, were apparently influenced by um, you know, uh, you know, he used to take car rides, you know, uh, his mother used to drive his father to work and he used to see this uh, Philips sign, I think it's an advertising sign, and there were the colours there, the greens and the blues, okay, and that apparently also influenced, right, the colours in this work. And this work also has been translated into many type of uh, mediums. Okay, in fact, when I was surfing, um, just yesterday, I came across this work in Ode to Art itself, I don't know whether they're still selling his work, okay, but in the form of tapestry, okay, so if you're interested, right, Oh, I think, I think they are still selling it, okay, right. I think in editions, right, so you can, you can buy the work. Okay, so it's available in print, tapestry, you know, um, yeah, and other kind of forms. Okay. 
So these are just some, you know, about, about love, right? As I, I spoken about earlier. Um, let's go on now. And to the first couple. Okay. Right, and human couples, in fact, have been depicted throughout the ages. Some as primordial or first couple, meaning to say that they were so-called the, the father and mother of humanity. Okay, primordial couple. And, uh, and in fact, these depictions of the, of the human couple or primordial couple, uh, in fact, uh, are rooted in the creation myths of many cultures and in fact, are represented in art itself. Okay, for example, uh, this work. Um, oh, I don't have the. Oh, it's, it's the Dogon. Okay, the God, Dogon was uh, one of the African uh, tribes. Okay, this is a, a work, um, uh, you know, depicting a primordial couple. Okay, now, uh, as uh, typical of uh, African art, okay, the figures are not, not very realistic. Okay, that is why, you know, African art actually influenced Western art. Okay, because of you know they don't really conform to, to reality. Okay, but in any case, we can distinguish between a man and a woman, right? So you see there they are actually seated on a stool. If you look closely, which probably you can't see from this slide, the stool itself is supported on, uh, by four images, four figures. Okay, and the stool itself is uh, symbolizes what you call the uh, the image of the world, right? The so-called axis mundi, right? The image of the world. Um, so everything has to do with, uh, I, I suppose, uh, with, uh, uh, with procreation, with fecundity, okay? These are probably fertility couples, okay? Many of these primordial couples have to do with, you know, uh, link to fertility cults, okay? And religion. And if you notice, um, the, the, the man on his, well, to our, our right, Okay, has his arms around the woman and his fingers are actually touching her breast. And if you look at his left hand, okay, he's actually touching his penis. Okay, so um, by those, those kinds of, uh, you know, um, act, okay, gesture, right, uh, it actually symbolizes their sexual union. Okay, and the jewelry that they wear actually also symbolizes their sexual power. Right, okay. Um, a woman on the left is wearing a kind of a mouth ornament, right? And the, um, the, the, the man on the right has a kind of a chin beard that, you know, you see in the representations of the pharaoh, okay? Actually, at the back, I, I believe at the back, on the back of the man it, uh, is carved uh, actually a quiver, a quiver and I think arrow as well, okay? Symbolizing his own role as a hunter, a warrior, a protector, okay? While the woman's back has actually a child, half on it, symbolizing her role as a mother, okay? Now, then we come, of course, to, you know, the first couple that we are all familiar with, Adam and Eve, okay, who, uh, which, uh, who are actually very commonly depicted, um, you know, um, in art, especially during the Renaissance, okay? Uh, normally, also as a reminder of the original sin, Right? Normally as, as a reminder of the, of the original sin. Um, so here, um, we, this is a famous work. Uh, actually, it's part of a mural. Right? And the mural, or the fresco rather, can be found uh, in the Brancacci Chapel in Florence. Okay? By the famous uh, Renaissance artist, Masaccio. Okay? And it's entitled, Expulsion from Paradise. Okay? And if you don't know who Masaccio is, Right, he has, uh, he's a very important early Renaissance uh, painter who influenced artists like Michelangelo, right? Because he was one of the first artists to, um, you know, to, to, to bring volume and, uh, you know, bark back to the human figure, right? If you look at the human figures in the medieval period, okay, they all look very rigid, stiff, unrealistic, okay? So, but Masaccio has given, you know, they, he was able to make humans look human again, right? And in this case, he was also able to infuse his figures with emotions, okay, which were again lacking in uh, medieval representations. Yes, Ali? Hmm? Was it Masaccio that did the four short things, or was it earlier paintings? Painting? 
Oh, the uh, the four shortening. Um, let me see. Perhaps you can find that in the works of Giotto. So yeah, it's, it was earlier, right? Thank you. Okay. Right. So here you see, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a scene from right the Garden of Eden. Okay. Um, this is rep, uh, this is this uh, picture represents the the the, the time when they were expelled. Okay, of course, uh, you know, Eve gave him to temptation, right? Uh, she ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, right? So she committed a sin against God, okay? And uh, Adam as well. And so they were driven out, as you can see, by an angel, okay, bearing a sword, <laughs> right? Okay, and you can see, you know, like, uh, you know, you can see that, that they are, they are I mean, the, the way that Masatio represented them, okay, really shows, um, you know, um, that uh, they were simply, you know, devastated. I mean, we can literally hear the cries of um, uh, Adam, you know, or the scream of Eve. Okay, right. I mean, they were, they were really driven out in shame, okay, from the Garden of Eden because of what they have done, right, okay. Um, so I, I think Masatio has uh, represented that, you know, really well, right, in this, in this picture. And we come to this... Um, sorry, the Yes. So where's the love part? Huh? Sorry? Where's the love? Oh, where's the love part? <laughs> where's the love part? In this? Yes, yes. Uh, not the love part per se, but uh, the, the primordial couple. Okay. Right, okay? That's, the, that's a theme. I'm going yeah. through, through, you know? <laughs> yes, that's, it's not all going to be, you know, yeah, of course, you know, the stings of love, you know, you know so you see sometimes uh, works that have, uh, you know, like honeycombs and bees, you know, because artists want to represent the stings of love, that love is also sometimes accompanied by pain, you know, yeah. right, okay. okay, all right, and this uh, work, in, in fact, uh, dating to about 11,000 years ago, found in a cave, yes, Right, and uh, it says that, uh, is, is this the earliest depiction of a couple making love? Perhaps, okay, um, but is it really a couple at all? Okay, because um, in fact, when you, when you look at this work, uh, different people see different things, I suppose. Okay, you can see like a pair of breasts, perhaps. Uh, some see, uh, you know, a vagina, okay. Uh, others, a couple. Okay, but it's undeniably phallic in its form, right? It's, it's, uh, it's very phallic in its form. Um, but uh, most agree that it does represent the outline of a couple, okay? And uh, where even the hands and the legs are visible. And you can see uh, one um, uh, figure, you know, has his uh, arms around the shoulder, okay, or touching the shoulder of the other figure, and his legs, Okay, are tucked in underneath the legs of the smaller figure, right? So, um, you know, so this has led some uh, people to conclude that, well, you know, it clearly shows um, a couple, uh, uh, you know, maybe even, even copulating, right? Because of the positioning of the legs, right? And some uh, would even uh, uh, imagine a, a bit um, of, uh, you know, have, have some you know, would even go so far as to say that, well, you know, could it be a, you know, because the gender of this couple is not known. So could it be, you know, a representation, earliest representation of a gay couple, for example. Okay, but we are not sure because uh, details are lacking, right? Okay, so we can't, we can't really say uh, that much about, about this work. Okay, but I thought it would be interesting, okay, because of the speculation uh, around it. Okay, we come to the next uh, uh, sub, uh, sub team, which is the kiss, right? And uh, what, what better way to, uh, you know? And I must uh, say that, you know, the interesting thing about love is that uh, artists have different ways of representing love in their work. Okay, I, I, I think that's, that's interesting, right? In different mediums, okay? Uh, different forms of expression, right? And of course, the most famous, I would say, uh, kiss is uh, represented in Rodin's, okay, Auguste Rodin's 
sculpture called the Kiss. Right? I don't know how many of you know this story of the Kiss. Okay, but the Kiss was um, uh, prob this work actually was uh, originally part of uh, the Gates of Hell. Okay, the Gates of Hell is this monumental project that Rodin did. Okay, comprising over a couple of hundred figures. Okay, for the portal of uh, a museum of decorative arts. Right in uh, I believe in Paris in, in France. But it was never realized. So what Rodin did was that he stripped away some of these figures. Okay, and the figures themselves, like the keys, the three graces, the tinker, okay, all of them became, in a sense, uh, you know, individual figures in their own right. Okay, and so the keys was uh, actually part of the whole story of the gates of hell, which was actually based on Dante's, right? Uh, uh, the episode in Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, right? The episode of hell, right? And uh, this um, work, right, represents, in fact, uh, this couple called Paolo and Francesca, okay? And uh, it, was, it so happened that, well, actually, Francesca was not, uh, rather, Paolo, okay, um, uh, was not actually um, her husband. He's actually her husband's brother, right? Okay, so the, they were actually committing adultery, right? And they were reading um, a book on uh, Lancelot and Guinevere, right? And their passions grew as they were reading that, all right? So what happened is that when they were reading, unfortunately, uh, Francesca's husband came back, saw them, and murdered the both of them. Okay, and the, the book is still being held by uh, all right, Paolo in this, in this, uh, right, in this uh, sculpture. And they were actually condemned to, right, uh, you know, uh, to hell, okay? Perhaps for their, you know, likely for their adultery, okay? But uh, notwithstanding, you know, the, the, you know, the adul adulterous affair and all that, I think, you know, the, the keys here, I mean, it's, it's probably the most, as I said, one of the, probably the, perhaps the most famous image of the case, okay, because I think, firstly, it's because of the dynamic composition of the work, right, and um, the smooth modeling as well, okay, and, uh, and of course, the universal character of the work. I think that's what, all this makes the work, you know, so famous and popular. All right, and uh, let's go on to the next image. And this is the work by Gustav Klim. Okay, another famous kiss, right? And uh, you know, just to give a background, uh, Klim was, um, uh, if for those who don't know him, uh, he's the leader, you know, uh, of the, the Vienna Secessionist Movement. Okay, because at that time, at the turn of uh, the 20th century in Vienna, Okay, Vienna was still a conservative society. Okay, the art was dominated by the academies and there was a lot of censorship in place. So Klim was the leader of this group of young artists who rebelled against the establishment. Okay, and uh, he's a very eccentric artist, I mean, but uh, his works show a, a kind of sensitivity to, you know, to women in, in terms of how he was able to represent the allure and the, the mystery of womanhood, okay? So in this work, um, right, we, we see, um, and this work is typical of uh, Klim's uh, signature works, right? A works uh, uh, which uses, for example, if you look at the background, gold, okay, gold leaf, in fact, right? And uh, the, the, the patterns and the decoration reminds one of mosaics, right? In fact, uh, Klim himself was very much influenced by the mosaics he saw, uh, the Byzantine mosaics, right, in Ravenna. Right, in Italy. Okay. So what you have here is a couple lost in uh, you know, the ecstasies of love. Okay. In fact, if you notice, the man is actually, I believe, is standing, while the woman is actually kneeling down. Okay. She's not standing, in fact. You look at her, she's kneeling down. And, they are, and it's happening on the edge of this meadow. Right? You can see the meadow there. Okay. Um, and you know, if you look at the woman herself, you know, she's simply... Uh, it's like she has soon, right, from this, okay, um, uh, the case that, you know, that's being planted by the man, right? 
Okay, but only, as you can see, only the head, certain parts are only visible, the head, right, the hand, the legs, right, and the whole, the, the other parts of their body and all that are enveloped by this uh, rich, intricate mosaic patterns, okay, that coupled with the gold background, okay, also give the works a kind of a lush sensuality. Okay, I think that's what makes this work, you know, uh, so, so loved and so well known. Right, because of the rich, intricate patterns, the gold background, and again, the universal kind of theme okay, we see here. And we have, um, the next artist is Mark Chagall. Okay, and Mark Chagall, uh, yes, uh, right, he was uh, born in Russia, of course. Right? He never forgot his Russian roots. Okay, and Mark Chagall is also one of my favorite artists. Um, you know, and, and I mean, it is, it's difficult not to like his work, right? It's difficult because of the colors, because uh, there's always an element of fantasy in his work. Um, so here, uh, you know, it's entitled Birthday, right? Whose birthday, right, is it? Okay, it's uh, actually his wife's birthday. Okay, and you see uh, on the left, uh, you'll see, uh, I think, a, a birthday cake. All right, she holds a bouquet of flowers. Okay, and you see uh, uh, some other details around. Okay, but I think what's uh, striking, interesting in this work is that the figures seem to be um, uh, floating. Right? Okay, I mean, he has uh, exaggerated the figure somewhat by elongating it. Right? But he also uh, makes the figure defy gravity. And there's something that happens. Uh, uh, quite a lot in Chagall's work. Right, you see figures uh, kind of uh, uh, defying gravity, flying. Right? But I think it's most appropriate here. Okay, because uh, I believe the man who is kind of you know, lifted up the, off the ground is Chagall himself. Right? And uh, you know, because of, he's so in love with his wife that, you know, and the ecstasy, he, he, he probably felt that you know, he, you know, he simply you know, kind of uh, float off the ground and you know, give her a kiss. Right. So I think you know, that the kind of um, uh, fantasy in his work, the element of fantasy, okay, um, uh, makes his work uh, very appealing, right? as well as um, uh, also the colors used as well. Okay. Now this work, okay, as I said, now today is not all about uh, lovey-dovey couples, you know, right? <laughs> romance, you know. All right, uh, uh, but also about frustrated desires. Okay, some artists have uh, also depicted frustrated desires, right? Like uh, Rene Magritte. Um, in fact, frustrated desires was uh, um, is one of the common themes in Magritte's work, right? Okay, so you can see how here Magritte has transformed an act of passion into one of isolation and and one of um, you know, uh, a kind of alienation as well, right? Because you see that uh, try as they might, you know, to connect, to kiss, they can't because of the, the cloth, right? A kind of uh, that balaclava-like cloth, you know, that covers their head. Um, you know, so, you know, you see talking about love here. I mean, the, the title is uh, The Lovers, okay? Right, but likely not. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, he's uh, pro perhaps talking about frustrated desires here, right? And the fact that uh, he wants to show that, uh, you know, of our inability to unveil the true nature, even of our most intimate companions, right? Okay, so it can be read uh, in, in, you know, uh, in, a, in a few ways, right, this work. Okay, this uh, motif of uh, having the cloth all right, of having a cloth wrapping up a person's head is uh, quite common in some of Margaret's work. Okay, because uh, when he was young, he witnessed the drowning of his mother. Rather, he witnessed his mother's body being brought up from the sea after she drowned. And her, I think her nightgown, you know, kind of uh, wrapped her head. Right? And that, you know, that sort of left an impression on him, okay, on Margaret. And uh, he has uh, represented that in uh, many of his works, okay. 
Yes, I mean, going back to romance, right? So here, <laughs> okay, I, I don't know. I think uh, some of you might have uh, seen this work as well. Very famous work, okay, Robert Duano. Okay, Robert Duano, Kissed by the Hotel in the View. Right? In fact, uh, this, there's an interesting story behind this very famous photograph that has now, uh, is forever associated with Paris and with romance. Okay? Uh, taken by a, a very famous photographer who together with uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, you know, uh, actually pioneered uh, photo um, journalism. Okay? And in 1950, he was asked to um, do, take some uh, photographs for, you know, uh, of couples on the streets of Paris for a spread by Life magazine. Okay, um, okay, but that uh, and it wasn't until thirty-six years later, right? In, 30, in 1986, he was asked by a publisher to for permission to reproduce this. Okay, for for work, right? And uh, that's how the this image actually spread, right? The the fame of this image. Right, it was only in the 1980s that you know, the, the, you know, this image began to so-called go viral, you know, it spread. Okay. But what's interesting is this, that uh, I think probably after it became famous, okay, um, uh, this, the photographer Duano actually faced two lawsuits. Two lawsuits were brought against him. Okay. One by a couple claiming that they were the couple right, in the photograph. Okay, and another one by a woman who claimed that she was a woman, right, in the photograph. Okay, right. So of course they wanted some money, you know, like perhaps some royalties or something, right? Okay, but and you know, Duano was quite reluctant to say, you know, to reveal who the couple actually is. But because of the lawsuit, he had to, and he revealed that these were these two cu this couple were, were they were aspiring actors. In fact, okay, he saw them actually kissing. And he actually asked them to stage for him that kiss again. So it's actually a staged photograph, not a spontaneous one. Okay, as I think as it was believed before. All right. Okay. So I think I thought that was you know um, interesting. And judging by by the couple, you know they they also confess that they enjoy kissing a lot. And you know, so here, uh, right. We, obviously, you know we can see that in the photograph. Okay. Um, okay, so the bad doers part, okay, right, so um, we want to look at um, couples, for example, um, this work by Peter Paul Rubens, okay, um, you know, a, a, the, one of the most famous uh, Western artists, you know, and, and one of the most famous Baroque artists of the Baroque era. Okay, and as you know, you know, Rubens uh, was more than an artist. He was a diplomat. Okay, he served in uh, several European courts. Right? He was asked to negotiate peace between uh, you know, European countries. He used his own art to promote peace. He was, I think, the first artist to be awarded an uh, honorary degree by Cambridge University. Right? So he was a distinguished artist. Okay, in terms of his art, as you know, he's uh, famous for his depiction of women. Right, he, he depicted his woman in uh, in a particular way as uh, I won't say fat, right? They are they are rather, you know, on the plump side, <laughs> voluptuous. That's right. That's the word. Yeah, fleshy, voluptuous, right? Okay, and it's given you know rise to this term called Rubenesque. You know, when you say something is Rubenesque, okay, that's that's his style. Okay. Um, in any case, coming back to this work. Um, this work was done, uh, you know, not long after the. They got married, okay. He and uh, Isabella Brand, okay. Isabella, Isabella Brand is the woman depicted here who became his wife, okay. And uh, and you know Rubens, as I mentioned before, has served in the in the in you know he moved around in courtly circles, although he was not an aristocrat, okay. But in this painting, especially, it's a double portrait of himself and his wife. You know he, you know he's, he aspires to be. An aristocrat, or at least take on the manners of, you know, an aristocrat. Okay, and we can see that in the, his fashionably dressed, um, you know, uh, kind of um, the fact that he's fashionably dressed, and the fact that he actually has a sword there. You know, uh, again, you know, uh, tells us that you know um, he wanted to aspire, you know, to to aristocracy. 
Okay, but uh, what's interesting also is his wife. I mean, his wife is uh, lavishly costumed as well. She wears a very large, voluminous uh, red uh, silk, I suppose, a, a kind of a skirt or dress. Okay, she has a large uh, lace ruff around her neck. She wears a kind of a Florentine hat. Okay, and again, the status of the couple can be seen especially in uh, Isabella's, uh, the jewellery that, that, that adorns her. Okay, uh, but what's interesting also is, is the couple, how do they display their affection here? Look at his right hand and her right, and her right hand, they are joined together. Okay, now that joining of the hand actually has legal significance, right? But here I think uh, Rubens has gone beyond that legal, legal significance and really portray them in, you know, with loving kindness in that, of their love for each other. Okay, right. But uh, it's a rather egalitarian work in terms of the quality of the sexes, but I feel that, you know, the artist has tried to also um, elevate, you know, um, Ruben somewhat above his bride, you know. Uh, so you can see in terms of the position, his, uh, she, she's actually uh, kneeling down, you can see. You know, she's uh, kneeling, right? And, the, and th that is why his, uh, right, his position you know, a bit higher than her here. But other than that, I think it's an egalitarian kind of, an equal relationship. Not to forget the background. Sometimes when you look at Renaissance Baroque works, the background you know, sometimes adds, contributes to the meaning. Okay, so here the background you have a honeysuckle boa. Okay, and the honeysuckle actually is a symbolism for love. Okay, and so is, for example, in Renaissance art, you always see gardens and all that, right? Gardens also, you know, uh, are a kind of symbolism of, uh, for love, right? So, you know, you see here, everything is green, everything is flourishing, everything is blossoming. Okay, so it's a perfect setting, right, for their love. Have you seen this work? Right? If not, then you, know, uh, you have to know this because it's one of the most important finds, one of the most famous finds um, uh, in, uh, uh, when Howard Carter right, discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamen in 1922. Okay? It's one of the most valuable finds. Right? It's a throne chair of Tutankhamen. Okay, and uh, I mean, what makes this object valuable? I think uh, the, the, the craftsmanship, the materials used. Okay, I mean, the chair itself was made of wood, but it's covered with sheets of gold as well as silver, inlaid with uh, semi-precious stones, um, and also with colored glass. Okay, and there are a lot of uh, details you see there, right, in terms of its subject. Okay, uh, one very prominent uh, uh, motif you see here is this. You see a circular kind of uh, uh, object that looks that represents the sun and the rays. Okay, now that actually represents Aten, A T E N, right? Aten, the sun disk. Okay, and this um, King Tutankhamun um, belonged to what you call the Amana period. Okay, together with uh, Akhenaten, you know, uh, you know, and, and uh, that was a short period, right, uh, where uh, Akhenaten decided, okay, that um, from, from then on, you know, Egyptians were to only worship one god, and that's the sun this Aten. Okay, so for a time, uh, believe it or not, okay, uh, Egypt actually became monotheistic, right? Okay, but, uh, uh, but uh, just to tell you, you know, I mean, what happened after that uh, was that uh, it angered many of the priesthood. They were angry. Okay, so in fact, after the death of uh, Akhenaten, okay, many of his sculptures, his statues were destroyed. Okay, because you know, the, the priests were simply unhappy that you know, he ordered the worship of just one god. All right, um, so we see Okay, so the sun disk, yes, I mean the sun, you know, kind of um, the sun disk, okay, gives life to both Akhenaten and his wife, who also happens to be his half-sister, right? I mean, uh, you know, kind of incestuous marriage was, right, uh, not uncommon then, right? But 
with the uh, with the revolution in religion, you know, the worship of one God, also came a revolution in art. So if you look at art in the Amana period, right, uh, you know, you, you could see that, um, you know, the way that Akhenaten and his and his queen um, Nefertari was was it Nefertari or Nefertiti? Okay, anyway, he and his queen, and also um, in this in this work, you see that he has departed from that kind of uh, stylized, you know, very stiff representation of the pharaohs. Okay, so if, and it's most evident in this work, right? Uh, you know, the, the kind of fluidity you see here, the naturalism, right? You see in the figures of, uh, you know, um, King Tut, right? And, and his queen, okay? They are quite evident in this work, right? And also the, the kind of um, um, love, you know, uh, that, that is uh, expressed in this work, right? The love of the, the wife or, right, the husband, okay? It's not something that is quite common in Egyptian art. Okay, but we see here, you know, she's actually anointing his hand with perfume, right? Okay, so, so it's a, it's a, it's a um, you know, episode of, uh, um, okay, love here that we see, you know, I mean, it's a rare kind of um, a sight, you know, in, in uh, Egyptian art, right? Oops. Actually, I can, you know, just, talk about this in one lecture, but unfortunately we only have okay, one hour. I mean, there's so much to talk about. I mean, this is one of the most well-known works um, you know, uh, in the history of Western art. Okay, uh, some of you have probably seen it in person. It's in the National Gallery in London. Right? Um, and it's a small work, in fact. It's a very small work. Uh, yes. Uh, but it's rich with detail and with symbolism. Okay, so here uh, the, the uh, Flemish artist Jan van Eyck, right? Okay, he's a, he's a Flemish artist. Um, he painted uh, this couple, Giovanni and uh, Giovanna Arnolfini. Okay, and um, Giovanni was actually um, originally from Italy. He was a merchant. Okay, and. Uh, now, there's a lot of uh, discussion and debate about this work, okay? But uh, uh, and a German art historian called uh, Erwin Panofsky, okay, uh, using his theory called iconography, okay, try to uh, interpret this work, okay? Um, you know, uh, he said that those objects that you see there, okay, um, they are not simply household objects. They have a kind of a hidden symbolism. Okay. But first, uh, just before I talk about some of the objects, right? the couple, okay? Giovanni and Giovanna. Right? Again, like the Rubens painting, you see them joining hands, and that itself could be legally binding. right? It could be a, a, a sign of betrothal. It could also be a sign of marriage, perhaps. Okay? Panofsky thought that it was, uh, you know, it, it kind of was a symbol of their, their marriage. Right? And the man makes a kind of a gesture with his right hand. Okay? We are not against quite sure what, what the gesture means. Um, you can see uh, Giovanna holding up her, her gown, okay? Not that she's expecting a child, okay? But uh, she's trying to, it's, it's a symbol to say that she will be, you know, she will bear perhaps many children later, okay? So it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a symbolism of uh, fecundity, fertility, right? Um, and even the color green, I suppose, you know, uh, you know has to do with, um, associate, I suppose, with fertility. And the symbols you see there, as I said, okay, uh, according to Panofsky's interpretation, um, shows that this is actually a, a holy matrimony taking place. Okay, the fact that you see uh, um, footwares, right, I mean, the, the, I mean, being taken off, okay, shows that they're standing on holy ground. The fact that there's only one lighted candle on the chandelier, even though it's uh, daytime, okay, um, indicates or symbolizes divine presence. Okay, the mirror you see behind here, on the frames of the mirror are depicted the passions of Christ. Okay, so clearly there are a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, Christian religious symbolism uh, in this work. Okay, the dog itself, okay, symbolizes fidelity, right? Traditional symbolism of the dog is fidelity, right? 
Okay, but people dispute it. You know, I mean, there, there, were, there were researchers after Panofsky who, who did research, right? Archival research, and they found that there was never evi any ev evidence that, you know, uh, this, uh, this was painted before, you know, um, or after they were married. Okay, uh, you know, and, and some even disputed or dispute that this actually is a, is a you know, uh, represents a married couple. Okay. Uh, that is why you know, the National Gallery is very careful in the title of this work. You notice it's called the Arnolfini Double Portrait. Okay, in some books, it will have like the Arnolfini Marriage okay? or, or the Arnolfini Betrothal or something. You know? right? okay? But you see the National Gallery wants to avoid that controversy. Right? What are the slippers again? What do the slippers mean again? Oh, the slippers. You know, and then there's, okay, actually, okay, okay. Um, so here, the, 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 the footwear, there's one here and then one uh, uh, closer to, you know, uh, to the bed. Um, you know. In fact, this whole place is actually a bedroom, right? Okay, but one is actually, uh, you know, further, further in. Um, it's the fact that, you know, it, it uh, alludes to the Bible when, you know, Moses was asked to take out his own footwear when he enters the burning bush, right? So they're actually standing on holy ground, okay? But you have some Marxist reading of the work as well, which is also very interesting, okay? That the fact that the, the, you know, the husband's footwear is closer to the window, you know, or the door, and hence closer to the outside world means that, you know, he's the one who kind of bring the bread back, you know? So, you know, so a Marxist reading will see that, <laughs> or a, rather a feminist reading, okay? Rather, not, not a Marxist, a feminist reading, okay? We'll, we'll see the segregation of roles, you know, that, Women are only men to uh, bear children and things like that, right? Okay, so there are different readings of this work, okay? Okay, but it's an interesting, yeah, interesting work. Books have been written on this work, in fact, right? Okay, so that, that, that part is uh, till death do us part. So this part, just one image, you know, till death do us not part, right? Okay, um, so for this, uh, this image uh, is also quite a famous image. Uh, it's actually a, uh, you can call it a sculpture, I suppose, right? A sculpture. Um, but it's actually a sculpture atop what, what looks like a sarcophagus. If you made a coffin, all right? But some see it more as a large urn, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, it was believed to contain uh, human remains, uh, probably cremated human remains. Right, and here it depicts uh, a couple, um, you know, um, who, are, who are probably uh, uh, a married couple, right? Um, and again, you know, interesting, it's interesting to note that the couple here is uh, seated in a reclining fashion on this uh, so-called bed or couch. Okay, and that's how actually the Greeks, you know, um, uh, uh, sit, were, were seated, you know, when, whenever they had banquets, right, in a reclining position on a couch, right. Um, but I think what is striking with, uh, you know, this is uh, from the Etruscan period. I don't know if you know what the Etruscan period means, but the Etruscan, the Etruscans were actually the major force in Italy, right. They actually ruled Italy before the Romans, okay, the Italian peninsula, all right. And uh, in fact, uh, um, you know, uh, funerary art, okay, was uh, one of, uh, uh, you know, a major component of their culture, okay. Um, so here we see uh, a couple, and what is striking about this couple really is um, they just seem so happy, right. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that they are the, 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 the works here, the sculptures are stylized, you know, they are shown with uh, oval faces, almond shaped eyes, right, plated hair. Okay, but the fact is that, you know, if you look at them, they, they, are, they look happy. Okay, um, again, you know, uh, we can speculate as to why they are depicted here on, on the coffin. Okay, it's, uh, I mean, one, one kind of a strong reason is that, you know, or a strong possibility is that, you know, uh, perhaps by doing this, right, they, they believe that they could perpetuate this bliss, this happiness in the afterlife, okay? I think that's, you know, uh, probably a common kind of assumption, right? Okay, and the fact that this, uh, 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 the, the man has his arms, you know, uh, around the woman, okay, 
And I, I'm not sure what gesture she's making, probably a gesture of offering something, right? Okay, but you know, and you know, and also the Etruscan society was a very egalitarian one, okay, between men and women. In fact, in Greece itself, right, women was actually not allowed into banquets. I don't know whether you know that, okay, but here in the Etruscan society, you can see that you know both men and women actually enjoy the banquet together, right? Also, to note the fact that it was it was originally painted, okay, mm. right? So it would have been brighter than uh, what you see here. Okay, you've heard of the saying, "Men are from Mars, women are from Venus." Okay. And we can see that uh, in this next image uh, by Sandro Bodicelli. Okay. And uh, Sandro Bodicelli um, was an early Renaissance painter together with Masaccio, whom I mentioned um, earlier. Okay. But his style was in, or is in contrast to that of Masaccio, right? in the way he actually draws his figures. Right, he draws his figures in a, in a rather uh, kind of a stylized, more elegant style, okay, rather than the kind of bulky, you know, style of Masaccio. Okay. And uh, this work is uh, one of his most famous works. And uh, Bodicelli, of course, was is also is famous for his mythological paintings. Okay. Now, notice uh, before going to the subject matter, right? Notice the unusual um, shape of this work. Okay. Now, it led some people to believe that this work was originally part of a piece of furniture. Okay. It could be a chest, it could be a bed state, right? we don't know. Okay. But um, the subject itself, uh, again, we are not quite sure as to who commissioned this work. Okay. There was speculation that it was uh, one of the Medici uh, family members. Okay. And this was probably hung in uh, right, the bedroom. Okay. We are not sure. Or part of a bed, right? Uh, but uh, if you look at this, right, it, it uh, tells the story of, of course, Mars, the god of war, and Venus, or Aphrodite, right, the goddess of love. Okay, and uh, they, I mean, you could not find a more, more contrasting uh, characters here. You know, Venus, you know, is much alert. Okay, while Mars okay, is uh, sleeping the little death. Now, there is a phrase used you know, after a bout of love making. You know, right? okay, he's, uh, he's totally flat out. Okay, nothing could wake him up. You know, even the satyrs here, okay, the, the, the satyr trying to blow a trumpet you know, into his ear, couldn't wake him up. Okay? And while he's asleep, okay, they are actually playing with his, uh, his, his weapons and his armor. Right, and uh, in fact, they have. Um, in fact, this is a joke, right? A joke that he's actually now disarmed, right? So to speak, okay, right. And actually, there are some uh, bees. I don't know whether you can see wolves hovering above his head. Okay, and that could mean two things. One is that they represent the stings of love. That love is often accompanied by pain. Second, they could be a symbol of the Vespucci family. Now, it was believed that perhaps this work was commissioned by the Vespucci family, whose symbol okay, um, is actually the wolves. Okay, so, there could be a possibility, right? These possibilities. Right? Now, what's the message of this whole work, okay, the theme? is that love conquers war, okay? or love conquers all. Right? That's, I think that's the, the main Right, kind of theme of this work. Okay? The god of war being conquered by the goddess of love. It's quite erotic to some extent, right, if you look at it. Okay? But it is done with such uh, poetry and lyri lyricism, you know, typical of um, uh, uh, Bodicelli, right? It looks very fresh, it's difficult to believe it's 1483. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it looks definitely looks very fresh, you're right. Yes, Apollo mm. and Daphne. Again, this is not, you know, uh, 
right, love as in love, right, Lily? But uh, it's actually, again, you know, um, this is, if you know the story of uh, Apollo and Daphne, right, uh, is, is uh, trying to get away from love itself, okay? Um, okay, so here you have this story of Apollo and Daphne. Um, what happened was this, that Apollo, of course, was struck by a Cupid arrow, okay, which, uh, um, make him excited and animate, right? Okay, so he had a, he was consumed with desire for Daphne. Okay, but the problem is this: Daphne was also struck by an arrow, but what you call a love-repelling arrow. Okay, that makes her deny the love of men. Okay, so you know he and he was uh, so he would be chasing her. You know, he would chase her. He's he's trying to, you know, and while he was chasing her, he would boast. You know, make a lot of. Uh, boastings and uh, promising a lot of things, you know, just to probably win her love. Okay, but she was, of course, trying to get away from him until such time that, you know, she, she could not anymore. And at that point, she prayed uh, to her father, who was a river god. I can't remember his name exactly, Peneus or something. Okay, uh, and then at that time, a kind of a, a torpor sees her. Suddenly, her, her bosom, you know, kind of started to turn into a bark. Uh, her hair started to turn into uh, leaves, okay? And then her hand turned into branches and her legs into roots. She was turning into a tree, okay? So she turned into a tree eventually, okay? But um, Apollo was not to be denied, okay? Right? He, he loved the tree, right? He hugged it and he also, you know, he kissed it, okay? But here I think, it's, it's, a, it's a masterful piece of work where Bernini all right, was able to, trans, you know, to, to represent the, the, this episode at a time when she was transforming to a tree. Right? Okay, and, uh, and, and again, Bernini, of course, you know, he's one of the most um, uh, brilliant sculptors who ever lived. Okay? Uh, known for his ability to turn really stone into flesh. Right? Okay, and, and for his uh, so-called technical virtuosity. Right. But he probably had the help of assistance here. And while she was being chased, you know, when, when she was already tired, you know, and could not resist anymore, you know, she prayed to her father, and that's what she said there, destroy the beauty that's injured me, or change the body that destroys my life. Okay. That's a that's a prayer to a you know to a father. Okay, now we move on to one of the most uh, famous works uh, in Renaissance art by one of the most famous artists, Titian. Okay, or Titian, Titian, right? Some people pronounce his name. Um, he's a Venetian artist, okay? Perhaps, uh, or, you know, undeniably I would say, you know, the greatest Venetian artist, Renaissance, Venetian Renaissance artist. Um, so here is um, a work uh, depicting, and you know, okay, I'll come to that later, right? I mean, Titian, of course, you know, what he's known for, okay, he also, he's a painter of um, a lot of mythological scenes, right? But he's also a very um, astute, okay, portrait painter. I mean, he was able to, you know, to, to, to study his, uh, his sitters very well and portray their character, right, in, in his, in his uh, portraits, okay? Now, this work is again taken from mythology. Right, um, and uh, it tells the story of Bacchus and Ariadne. Okay, Bacchus and Ariadne. Okay, what happened was this: that uh, Ariadne was abandoned by her lover Theseus. Okay, um, and she was left on the island of, island of Naxos. Okay, and you can see Theseus, uh, not Theseus, sorry, uh, Theseus' ship in the distance. Okay, so she's left stranded on this island. Um, then, uh, so happened, um, uh, Bacchus and his entourage came, you know, and, and I, I believe he was sitting on this uh, chariot driven by a pair of cheetahs, okay, here, right? And, you know, Bacchus is a god of wine, okay? So his followers are also very boisterous and very riotous. Okay, so you can see that some of them are already, you know, drunk, right? Yeah, drunk and, okay, they are in uh, merrymaking and, you know, and revelry, you know, that sort of mood, okay? You know, and, that, and, and 
when uh, Be Becker saw Ariadne, he immediately kind of fall in love, fell in love with her. So much so that he leapt from his chariot. Look at that. You know, he leapt okay, from his chariot into the air, trying to meet her. Okay? Right? But uh, she was taken aback. Okay, so by a gesture, you know, you can see that you know, she was rather taken aback by his advances. Right? Okay, and I think what's uh, interesting here is the, the, the so-called diagonal here, right, where you know, Beckers meets Ariadne. Okay, the, the kind of counter, counter movement you see there, right? Ariadne and Beckers. Okay, and really in terms of composition, I think it's a brilliant uh, work as well because um, you know, Titian is also known for the use of brilliant colors in his work. And we can see the brilliant colors used in the, in the sky, the colors in the sky, and the red, the red for the cape of uh, um, Bacchus. Right? While on the, on the right, on the lower right, you see that his followers are painted with rather more somber, earthy colors. Right? So what happened to um, Ariadne in the end? Okay, in the end, you know, he actually raised her to heaven, and she became a constellation. Okay, and we can see the constellation here. Right? So she became a constellation in the end. Okay? So this is a wonderful painting in terms of its color, in terms of its composition, and uh, of course also its story. Okay? And how the artists actually interpret right, the story as well. Okay, something that you know, is uh, delectable, you know, right? Amorous games. I wonder how many of you know about this painting, okay, by Jean Honoré Fragona, okay, called the Swing. Okay, it's a, it's not a very big painting as well. It's a it's a small painting. Um, is and we have to understand, you know, or, or know a little bit about at least um, uh, the Rococo style to which uh, Fragona's uh, Fragona sort of uh, subscribed to. Okay, was a Rococo painter. Okay, the Rococo style, uh, you know, took place in the 18th century, right? Mainly in France, um, and there, there was there are certain characteristics of the Rococo style. Okay, for example, is uh, marked by, you know, very uh, delicate uh, figures. Okay, um, uh, you know, the use of uh, very, um, you know, the use of tendrils, scroll work. Okay. Um, okay. Kind of uh, rather subtle colors. Okay. So these are some of the characteristics, and you can see all those characteristics in this work called the swing, right? In the, the kind of the, the freely patterns of the trees, okay, of the bushes, okay, the tendril-like patterns, the the scroll-like uh, clouds that you see there, okay, and the tendril-like patterns also can be. Seen in the in the in the lacy dress of the woman on the swing, okay. All right. So we have to understand that the Rococo style was meant to cater to the taste of the aristocratic class at that time, the courts, okay, to reflect the superficiality of court life. So I think it it suited to the you know to, to the superficiality of court life. Okay, the Rococo style is light-hearted, is playful, okay, and all that. Right. Okay, and that can be seen. You know, it's best epitomized, I think, in this work. Okay, the swing. Right now, what do we have here? Right, we have. I mean, on the surface, it's just like it's a lady on a swing. Okay, um, you know, and she's being pushed by this gentleman here. Okay, but look closely, and you'll find other things. There's this other gentleman here. He's like hiding in a bush. Okay. Extending his head out to her, okay, while uh, ha having a, a furtive peep underneath, right, addressed. Okay, I mean, he's a, let's put it this way: he's he was he's in a very advantageous position. <laughs> All right, okay, and uh, okay. Apparently, this work was uh, commissioned by a kind of a baron. Okay, and in fact, one other artist refused. To in fact paint the work according to the Baron's instruction, but Fragona took took the commission. Okay, I think because he, you know, the, the other painter considered it to be too, you know, too 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 naughty, too erotic. Okay, 
I mean, what, what the Baron? So the Baron said that, well, I want my mistress to be depicted on the swing. So we can assume that there's a mistress here. And that's him. He says he wants to be there, okay? Uh, you know, having a very advantageous position. And apparently this man here, okay? Now let me just, uh, I don't know. Uh, originally it was, I don't know whether it's still a clergyman, but you know, the Baron wanted the clergyman to be there because uh, his work actually involved collecting taxes from the church, okay? So in a way, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether it's an insult you know, to, uh, you know, to the clergy, but he wanted the clergyman to push her, right? Uh, on the swing, but there's a lot of uh, kind of a love, love symbolism in this works, uh, even erotic sexual symbolism, right? Now the shoe. Okay, I mean, of course, you know, if you are if you're on a swing and then you know you go high high enough, sometimes your, your shoe is bound, bound bound to you know just uh, right fly off. But here, the shoe losing your shoe at that time, right, is taken to be uh, losing one's virginity. Okay. And also the head, extending a head at that time is actually extending a sexual invitation. Okay? And uh, also the to and fro of the swing, you know, has a kind of sexual connotation as well. So, you know, really it's, it's, it's um, I said this work is, is full of symbolism. And to top it all off, right, again, you have uh, two Cupid like figures here on actually a, a, a hive. Okay, they're holding a hive, a beehive. Again, that could, that could represent the stings of love, as I mentioned, like the stings of love. But this sculpture here, not, I think this sculpture was based on the actual sculpture, okay, but also by a French sculptor. Okay, it says, shh, right? Don't tell anyone what you saw. Okay, right? So everything is, uh, as I said, is, 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 is very naughty in this work, right? Okay, it's actually full of uh, erotic symbolism. Okay, then that's typical of, that's typical of the Rococo. Okay, they like to depict, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Rococo artists like to depict gods and goddesses having amorous, you know, pursuits, uh, you know, elegantly men, uh, dressed men and women, enjoying themselves in a park. Okay, so these were the kind of themes done by Rococo artists. Okay, um, this work here, okay, uh, by Yutamaro, Kitagawa Yutamaro. Okay, now this work uh, was done in a, in, a, in a period, okay, the Edo period, and uh, it belonged to, uh, is uh, what you call the Okioe Prince, okay, U-K-I, uh, Y-O, okay, Okioe, right, Okioe Prince, okay. Um, it means pictures of the floating world, right? It's actually based on a Buddhist concept, but the people at Edo, of Edo, Japan, turn the concept upside down. Okay, meaning to say that if life is so short, why not enjoy life to the fullest, right? Because, you know, the Buddhist belief of that life is transient, okay? So if life is so short, why not enjoy to the fullest? So in this period, um, you know, such prince, such, not only the prince, but the subject matter, uh, erotic subject matter became very popular during this time. So many Japanese artists were depicting, uh, you know, uh, the brothels, courtesans, um, tea ladies, right? Okay, in the in the red light district, the Yoshiwara district in Japan, in Edo, Japan. Okay, I believe Edo is now Tokyo, right? Um, and uh, this work is actually the front piece of a poem, the poem of the pillow. Okay, and it depicts uh, two lovers. Now, compared to other um, Japanese prints, which um, especially of a, a, a certain genre called shunga. Okay, the shunga are those erotic prints and they are really pornographic. Okay, but this is considered to be tame compared to those other prints. Okay. Um, so, and such prints also exerted, um, you know, a, 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 an important influence on the Western artists, especially on the impressionist artists, right? The, the kind of asymmetrical perspective, the flatness, okay? Um, you know, the, the, the non-naturalistic colors, the cropping, the crop, the crop ages, all this were to have an influence on, um, you know, the, uh, 
the impression is even the subject, especially you know like Dega, you know Dega, you know suddenly he's also you know he has a series which depicted brothels as well, waiting in a cafe, right? And Dega was also very much influenced by the Okioye Prince, right? Okay, but other than that, let's talk about the subject here. Um, you have two lovers, right? Together, and uh, now nothing much seems to be happening here. They are probably uh, embraced in a kiss or locked in a kiss. Okay, um, you know, but there are hints of eroticism in this whole picture, right? And we can see those uh, um, erotic kind of uh, qualities here. For example, in the woman's hand the fingers touching the, the face of the man, right? Even the way that the fingers are depicted are quite, you know, quite erotic, okay? And the, the, the fact that you can see the man's eye here, right? And the, the, the faces joining as well, okay? And also the, the nip of, of the neck, okay? Those are also areas of uh, eroticism, okay? Um, also, uh, but I think the, 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 you know, the area where the, the part of the painting or of the, the work where you know you can the, where the hint of eroticism is strongest is here right is this part here where they are, you know where you see the legs I mean you don't actually see the legs of the couple okay but the transparent kind of um, transparency of the costume allows you to see you know that um, that there's probably more than meets the eye okay given the positioning of their legs Right. But the fact is that you know, the, 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 the drapery is so twisting and intermingling and cheating that nothing is obvious here. Okay. So it plays very much on suggestiveness, on, on, on strong hints. Red. <laughs> Red, yes. <laughs> right. But uh, yes, you know, um, so we don't know whether a kind of a, a copulation or coitus has taken place here. Okay. We are not sure. Okay. But I think that's what makes this work so famous. Right, because of its uh, suggestiveness, right? It, it's not, it's not outright erotic as such. Okay, now Hinduism. Okay, we have to understand. I mean, you know, sometimes you know when, when I show works uh, uh, of um, Hindu art, Hindu sculpture, you know, especially for example, I don't know whether you know this temple called Kajuraho. Okay, in North India, where the temple, the temples are filled with erotic pornographic sculptures. Right? How do you explain that? Okay, but uh, you know, the Hindus, uh, the openly, the Hindu religion actually openly celebrate uh, sexual love, all right? Uh, because they believe that this kind of sexual act reflect the union of the soul of the individual with the divine. Okay, and we can see the work here. And I think um, Lily, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier, um, you know, uh, Rajasthani painting. So we have an example of a Rajasthani painting here. Okay. In fact, it's from the Punjab Hills, right? And this, uh, these paintings are known as miniatures because they are very small. Okay, they are miniatures, um, but um, they are some of them are a delight uh, to look at. Okay, um, and many of these uh, Punjab paintings uh, depict scenes from Hindu mythology. Okay, um, so here one of the common themes is the story of Krishna and Radha. Okay, I don't know whether you know the story of Krishna and Radha. Okay, but uh, Krishna, when he was, I think, I don't know when he was a, a baby or when he was young, okay, his parents forced, fostered him out to a village because a demon king was trying to kill him. Right? And in this village, he became very close with mm. the cow herders. I mean, the, 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 the cow herds, you know, this uh, a woman okay, who, who tended right, um, the cows in the village. Okay, and he became, in particular, very close to one of the cowherds. Okay, her name is Radha. Okay, and so uh, many of these uh, Punjab, uh, uh, Rajasthani paintings, right, depict, okay, the, the, you know, the kind of uh, playfulness of, um, of Krishna with, with the gopis. They are called the gopis, right, G-O-P-I-S. Okay, and also in particular, right, um, uh, his relationship, uh, Krishna's relationship with Radha. Now, Krishna is, uh, if you don't know, he's the incarnation of Vishnu, one of the major Hindu gods, right? And uh, he always appears blue, 
right? Again, again, I don't go through to detail. I, I don't have the time how he got, right? He became blue and all that. Okay, but in painting, it's normally depicted blue. Okay, now this is what you call a continuous narrative. Okay, a continuous narrative is where a single figure appears many times in multiple scenes. Okay, in a single composition. Right. Okay, so here in the background. You see Krishna, that's not Radha, okay? That's like a messenger. Okay, he's trying to find out the whereabouts of Radha. Okay, so he got news, and then we next come here. Okay, right? So he's he's pursuing her. But you know, she's she's trying to she was a bit reluctant. Okay? Then fast forward, right? So we come here now. She has given in to his right, his caresses. You know, she's melting into his caresses. Okay, and then here. They are simply lost in the ecstasies of love, you know, <laughs> right? Okay, so, so here, uh, I think it's again um, we have to we have to see it as I say in the light. It's a metaphor, okay, metaphor for the soul, okay, the soul's yearning for the divine, right? Okay, and that, that's how you know it can be seen, okay. But I think what's interesting also is the use of the the trees and the bushes here for as compositional devices. Can you see here? So he uses the bushes, the trees, you know, to divide the scenes into little vignettes. Okay? And in particular, this work here, where you have a bush intertwining with a tree that echoes this, uh, right, this scene here. Okay? So it's a very clever use of this uh, so-called compositional devices right, in this work. Okay, I think we have uh, just a few more to go. Oh, this is the last part, in fact, right? Okay? Love and the erotic. Okay. I mean, of course, you know, the previous slides that I've shown you, okay, there are, of course, you know, some erotic works, okay, but I uh, just want to focus on, on you know, works that are, are more erotic here in this uh, particular section. Okay. Now, erotic is defined as of or pertaining to the passion of love, concerned with or, or treating love. Okay. Um, concerning or arousing sexual desire or giving sexual pleasure. Okay, and I think you, it's important to make the distinction between the erotic and the pornographic. Okay, especially when you look at contemporary art. Okay, what is erotic, right? What is pornographic? Do artists cross that line? Okay, do artists cross that line? Okay, uh, well, well, I'll come to that with the last image later on. Okay, but I want to show you this uh, wonderful work, wonderful sculpture. Okay, of eros sleeping. Of course, the word erotic, you know, is uh, has its origins, right? Okay, or based on the story, uh, you know, on, of, you know, um, the goddess eros, right? It's a rare bronze sculpture from the Greek period. Okay, the Hellenistic is like the, the late Greek. Okay, in fact, it's uh, it's after right, the period of Alexander the Great and his generals. Okay, the Hellenistic period. We don't know whether this is an original or whether it's a uh, is a Roman copy, but some uh, many scholars believe that it's a Hellenistic original. So it, it makes it a very rare bronze sculpture. Yes, I mean in terms of uh, conception, okay, a sleeping eros. I mean eros is also quite similar to Cupid. Okay, uh, it's also associated with uh, Venus. It's one of the gods of love, right? I mean in terms of its conception, it's also very original, very innovative, right? Um, so here. You have eros. You know, normally we see eros in the sky, or cupids in the sky shooting arrows. But here, he's come down to earth. He's sleeping. Okay, where is his arrow? I mean, where is his quiver and arrows? Now we are not sure, but it's not here. Okay, but we see the wings, so we know that you know it's, it's an eros. But he doesn't have his quiver and arrows. He's disarmed. Okay, right. So we are not sure whether it was uh, actually part. Uh, or whether it's uh, uh, destroyed or not, but it, it's, it's, it's likely that it's shown without uh, the quiver and the arrows, and perhaps there's a certain message that uh, you know is conveyed in this sculpture. Okay, but you know when you look at it, it's so there's a lot of you know naturalism in it, right? That you begin to think that it's probably based on a model, you know, maybe a model of a child, you know, uh, sleeping, right? Okay, wonderful sculpture. And you know, it's, it's works like this, you know, especially this uh, uh, sleeping eros that was to have an influence 
on later artists, you know, who who depict uh, the the cherubs and the the putis, you know, in their work, all right, later on. And talking about cupids and cherubs and all that, okay, you can see it in this work. Uh, a very famous work by Agnolo Bronzino, an allegory with Venus and Cupid. Now this work is uh, has defied interpretation. Okay, uh, I mean it, not really defied interpretation, but has really de you know um, challenged you know us to read it in different ways. Okay, and there's really no one uh, correct way. I mean that's what makes uh, you know artworks interesting. Okay, in fact uh, you know such works were created for the nobility, for the aristocracy. I think this was later given to King, I believe it's King Francis, okay, right, who owned it. Okay, and you know, in courtly circles, such works were created for discourse, for debate, for intellectual debate, right? It's like they were, they are, they were playing games, you know? It's like for, for intellectual games, right, the discourse. And uh, I mean, here we are only sure of the two main characters. Why? Because we know that they carry the attributes. Okay, first, the golden apple. Okay, and we know when, you, um, if a figure carries the golden apple, it must be Venus, because that apple was the prize she won from the, pe the, from the judgment of Paris. If you know the judgment of Paris is, you know, where she was voted the fairest of them all, okay, among the three goddesses. Okay, so the golden apple, right? And then uh, for Cupid, okay, I believe he has uh, wings. Okay, he has wings, um, and also the arrow. Okay, so we know, but then uh, it must be short, right? Why is I mean we know that Cupid, I mean, his mother is Venus herself. Okay, so he's actually kissing her and touching her breast. Okay, so to you that's an incestuous relationship. Okay which it might well be, okay, it's an incestuous relationship, okay, it might be an allegory of love, okay, all right, but anyway, going on to uh, some of the figures, can you see this man here, okay, this rather old man, you know, and he actually holds an hourglass, okay, so it's quite easy to identify him, I mean, he probably represents time, okay, his father time, okay, he's stretching out his hand, we are not sure why, okay, right, that sweeps across the canvas, Right? It's like he's trying to prevent this blue cloth from coming down. I'm not sure. Okay? Right? But you see another figure here. It's like an incomplete figure with eyeless sockets and, uh, you know, um, and a, a mask-like face. And that has been identified as oblivion. Okay? Right? And then coming down to this, probably a putti, right? Okay? Um, He's scattering roses, and the rose again is a flower associated with Venus. Okay, he's scattering roses, and he actually stands on a thorn, right? And then you have this figure here. Can you see this howling figure, right, with his hands on his head? Okay, he probably represents jealousy and conceit, right? And uh, this figure here, with uh, the head of the face of a girl, but the body of a, a creature, okay, probably represents uh, play or fraud. Okay, this boy represents uh, jolly, uh, uh, jest, okay, pleasure, right? So the whole theme here is about lust, is about jealousy, is about deceit. Okay, that could be the overall theme of the. But beyond that, we not we are not we can't say for sure what the figures exactly represents, okay? But it's a very, and you know, the eroticism of this, of this work is not only um, the incestuous relationship that's happening there, but I think the, the exaggeration of the figure, you know, because um, Bronzino was a mannerist painter, and mannerist painters tend to elongate their figures, and also the kind of alabaster kind of uh, tone, you know, of, of his figures, you know, kind of uh, heightened, right, his uh, eroticism as well, okay? Okay, two more to go. 
Now, the title of this work already is quite shocking, um, The Rape of Europa. Okay, Europa, of course, was this uh, goddess that was later to give birth to, you know, to Europe. Okay, so she's quite important in the, in the, in the scheme of things. Right? Um, now, it depicts uh, the story where, again, this was, this was painted by Titian, okay, whom we have just seen earlier. Okay, it depicts the, the, the story where Zeus, the chief of all gods, he transformed himself into a bull. And then he later lured Europa to ride on his back. And when she did that, he kind of uh, abducted her. Right? And they went to the island of Crete. Okay? And on the island of Crete, he consummated his passion. Okay? So, I suppose it's all shocking. I mean, so, in short, he raped her. He raped her. Okay? Uh, but, you know, maybe Titian wants us to believe that it's not sh so shocking if you were actually raped by a god. Okay? So he wants to depict the mythic significance of this work. Right? Okay? That, uh, you know, the, the, in fact, it can have, you know, this, this uh, sexual act by a god doesn't equate to sexual violence. Okay? In fact, it could have a transformative power, a positive outcome. Right? So he wants us to believe that, you know, this is no ordinary rape. Okay? Right? Okay, it's, uh, you know, it's actually, you know, uh, an act initiated by a god and the chief of all gods. Okay? So, um, so I suppose if you're an artist, you know, you, you know, you might be thinking, how do I depict that? You know, a woman who is, um, in, you know, full of pathos, but at the same time, you know, enjoy that act, you know, and full of pleasure at the same time. Okay, if you look at the figure of Europa here, obviously she's full of pathos, but if you look at it closely, I mean her tattered clothing and all that, but if you look at it closely, you know, she's also like, um, you know, uh, shown, showing herself to be full of pleasure. Right? Okay, and uh, so, um, it's that kind of paradox that, you know, Decent also wants to bring up in his work. And also you'll notice there are three cupids here. One riding on a fish. And, oops, so sorry. Okay, let me just, uh, oh, do I have to? Sorry, there's no other way to do this. We have gone through that much, huh? Okay, we are coming to an end. <laughs> okay. Yes, I mean the cupids, if you look at um, Europa, you know, uh, again, um, that fear that she's probably feeling at that time when she was being so-called raped by, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Zeus, okay, uh, is overcome by love, okay, represented by the cupids, right? Okay, but, uh, you know, of course, some people are not convinced by this, right? You have uh, especially feminist critics, Right? And one of them say that, you know, of course, again, when you look at Tizian's work, the brilliant luminous colors stand out, the textures, because of his use of many layers of glazing. Okay? But he also says that, uh, this critic says that, this painting has a dark side. It eroticizes rape. It glorifies rape. All right? I argue that this is an ethical defect that diminishes the painting aesthetically. So this is one thing that maybe you can consider after this session. Okay, do paintings like this, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, supposedly glorifies rape, sexual violence, okay, which is supposedly pornographic, okay, or highly erotic, does it diminish the painting aesthetically? Yeah, that's something for you to consider. Because, you know, like, this is a great painting by a great artist. Do you agree with her? Maybe you can answer that, right, after this. Uh, yeah, Lily, you have some thoughts on that? <laughs> okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, okay, we go on. Okay, while you're thinking, we go on to the last, uh, you know, last um, slide. And I want to wrap up. Okay, I don't know, people walking outside, you know, maybe wondering, you know, are you watching uh, some <laughs> porn, uh, I don't know, slideshow? Okay. Um, because this is a work 
uh, okay, done by Jeff Koons. And as you know, you know, Jeff Koons today, I think after Damien Hirst, he's the second um, most expensive living artist. Yes, richest. He's the richest now, I think. Yeah, richest living artist, yes. Okay, known for his uh, kind of um, you know, uh, works that are actually based on popular culture, which he you know, appropriates and then blow it up okay, and transform the material. Right? But this was a work called the Made in Heaven series okay, that he collaborated with his then wife, okay, La Cicciolina. Okay? Now, if you don't know La Cicciolina, okay, she's actually a porn star. Okay, but do you know that she was also elected into the Italian parliament? So she, Italian, Italian, okay, no, never mind. Okay, so she was, uh, yeah, she was an MP, imagine. And, um, okay, so this, she, they collaborated on this series of, uh, actually, photographs. Um, and, but, you know, their, their marriage was short-lived. I think they were only together for one or two years. Okay, and then they split up. Um, Okay, so in this, uh, this particular work is actually uh, made for a billboard. Okay, and later on, uh, these works were actually translated into things, into sculptures in three-dimensional forms. Okay, in fact, some of them are actually more erotic than this. Okay, are more pornographic than this, in fact. Right, okay, uh, so here he shows um, uh, himself engaging, uh, or themselves engaging in, uh, in sexual acts. Right, um, you know, uh, and, and if you look at the, you know, and for this work, in fact, um, um, the photograph photography was done by Cicciolina's own photographer, okay, and the, even the backdrops, right? So it has a kind of a distinctive aesthetic, okay, one of uh, what you might call a glamour photography, right? Okay, which even makes the image uh, a bit more shocking, right? And also the, the, the fact that, you know, um, such, such an image can appear in books on art, in art history. Okay, it makes it even more, I, I think, controversial. Okay? Because again, coming back to my question previously, do you consider this to be art or pornography? Where's the line okay, between fine art and pornography? Okay? Right? And what's, what's the, the, the aim of Kunz in making these works? Perhaps he wants to show the state of sexuality in visual culture. Perhaps he wants to challenge our convention of artistic taste. What is acceptable, what is not. Okay. So I think this is, uh, you know, as we wrap up this uh, lecture, this is uh, a food for thought for us. Okay, as we, we come to contemporary art, and especially in contemporary art, sex is used a lot, right? Okay, by artists. I don't know, for shock value of, or otherwise, right? And we have to find out, you know, whether artists has actually crossed the line, okay, right into pornography. Okay, so with that, I think uh, I'd like to end my my talk. And thanks for your attention.